Hello and welcome to the Quarterback in Your Life podcast. I am your host, Keenan Reynolds, joined as always by my agent, my brother, my marketeer, Tay Mock. What's up, brother? What's going on? How you feeling? I'm good, man. I'm good. Excited uh, for the week. Another week. Um, I think we're going to have some good conversation tonight. So enthusiastic about our guests and everything we got going on. For sure. Um, you know, super excited about the guests. We we actually talked to our guests uh in the early stages of our podcast, but we had some some technical difficulties, but we finally got that ironed out, and uh, now we have uh, Mr. George O'Garrow on. George, uh, welcome to the podcast, and thank you for joining us today. No, thank you. Thank you. Excited for the conversation, and thanks for having me. No doubt. So, so for our viewers, um, just to give a little background on George, um, he is a fellow Naval Academy graduate. Um, of, of 2005, um, did his did his service time. From there, um, he went to the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, where he uh, earned his MBA, and now uh, has pivoted to um, a job at a top, the top investment bank on Wall Street. Um, and I'm biased, and uh, so we're really great. We're really happy to have him on this podcast and I got a list of questions for you George last time you know I was kind of I was kind of frazzled a little bit all over the place but I'm focused man I got a list of things I want to ask you um and really it just kind of starts with you know tell us about your Naval Academy experience um you were a recruited uh basketball player so take us through that coming out of high school um you know getting a D1 scholarship what was it like playing division one basketball and uh, what was your, your academy experience like yeah, um, it was it was interesting. So I grew up in L.A. and, and was recruited, you know, a lot of mid low level D1 um, knew I wanted to play D1, had the benefit of playing with future NBA players. So I knew that they were going to the NBA and I was not. So <laughs> <laughs> my hoop dreams, you know, were were quelled pretty early on. Um, but I knew I was going to play D1. And then so Navy started recruiting me. And honestly, I had no idea what it was, um, but my uncle went to the Air Force Academy on my mom's side. So my mom saw a letter and was like, what's this? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> and that's kind of what, what got me interested. And I knew like it was a great academic school. Um, we At that time, we were really competitive and we're winning Patriot League, going to the tourney, et cetera. Um, so decided to go there. And honestly, I mean, in the beginning, it was a struggle. I think a lot of us, you know, recruited athletes tend to um, or really any, everybody tends to struggle freshman year. But I was a you know really good student in high school and uh, you know freshman year was a beast. Just basketball commitment was that much harder. School was that much harder. Um, so, you know, adjusting to the military, all that kind of stuff. Um, but then like, you know, got my feet underneath me. And as you know, Keenan Navy over recruits. So we started off with 10 freshmen and we ended up with three mm-hmm. who graduated and played all four years. And I mean, overall, I had a great experience. I just loved the hoop, so I never gave any thought to quitting. Um, mm-hmm. Enjoyed the experience. You know, we had a coaching switch my senior year, which was, uh, I think, a, turned out to be a, a nice change of pace for us. Um, so overall, you know, good experience. Would would do it the same way as you know, my brother, my younger brother's your classmate. Mm-hmm. Um, so if it was that terrible, I wouldn't have allowed him. To go. <laughs> <laughs> for sure, and it's funny that you bring up. Uh... Greg, uh, I remember distinctly, please, summer, uh, you sent him a package. And uh, and I think I told you the story, like, one of the first few times that we talked on the phone was you sent him a package and it was just, like, go Army. It was, like, everything you don't want to get in the middle of please summer because they open they open your packages. For those that don't know, in please summer is boot camp, right? So you're at nighttime, it's, like, when they deliver the mail and everybody's standing in the hallway facing each other at attention. And they bring your mail in. And they, if you have a package, they make you open it because they want to make sure, you know, you don't got no, like, I don't know, contraband, whatever that may be, cell phone. You're not supposed to have a cell phone or, or iPod, whatever. And they open his box, and it's all this Army stuff. And it was from his brother. And so he got he got a lot of shit from the detailers or, or the drill sergeants uh, that night just because his brother decided to play a joke and, and knew that it was going to cause some problems during police summer. So... That was kind of my, my first experience uh, with George, and uh, I mean, obviously, we, we met uh, we met while I was at the academy, and then you know really got to know each other after the academy. But um, one thing you kind of touched on that 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 I want to kind of park at and, and talk about was, 
you talked about how um, coming in as a freshman, you really struggle, right? And I've talked to a few of my classmates about being a freshman athlete, about struggling. And, and the one thing that, that I always ask myself is like, does it really have to be that way? Um, you know, I always kind of felt like when I came in, there was almost like a culture of like, it's okay to be like mediocre in the class. Like if you're not that good in the classroom, it's no big deal. Like you're a freshman. And like you said, you're transitioning. And I almost felt like kind of looking back on it, I asked myself, is that really the kind of mindset we should have? And it was really prevalent amongst like the young black recruited athletes. I think it was, that was a conversation that was more had amongst the black athletes. And like you said, I was a good student in, in high school. I was a four old guy. Like I had no problems. The school was always easy. Then I come in freshman year and yeah, you know, you're doing, during the military, you're playing sports, but yeah, I don't think the work was just that much more different. I honestly felt like looking back on it, I just kind of got caught in that cycle of mediocrity. Um, that kind of festered amongst the young black freshman group. And then, and it really started because the upper class were kind of, you, you come in and that's what they're telling you. That's what they're telling you that that's, that's how it should be. But, you know, hearing you say that made me think about it and feel like it shouldn't be that way. Like we should, we should come in and strive for that, that same type of excellence that we've had in the past. I mean, honestly, it's, it's really short sighted and you're right. I think, you know, by the time, by my senior year, we tried to change the culture a little bit, but it's really pervasive throughout the academy. And honestly, it impacts, you know, us brown and black people, right? Because what happens is they come in, they try to tell you, look, don't worry too much about your classes, et cetera, as a way of, you know, having you come and commit right into the program and, and be focused on the sport. But at the end of the day, when I was looking back in my transcripts and thinking about going to business school, right, and then like mm -hmm. the average GPA is, you know, 3.5, 3.8, 4 and I'm sitting here like, well, I, you know, did not have that, right? <laughs> like, what am I, you know, how is this going to impact my chances? It really, it was mostly freshman year, just that transition and the struggle. And then, mm -hmm. you know, I did fine after that. But also there was no pressure from anybody to get good grades to do any better. Because again, they're not thinking about your life post graduation post Navy it's like hey do what you got to do to hoop um, yeah. and that honestly ends up penalizing us in the long run unfortunately unless you have family telling you to do it or you have your own inner drive to do it um, we tend to get preyed upon and I mean that's not an academy thing I think that's true of, of all you know competitive D1 sports institutions for sure and, and I actually had the same type of experience uh, as I was you know transitioning I'm looking at like, you know, do I want to go to business school? And I get my official transcripts and I'm looking at my grades and I'm just like, oh man, like that first semester, that first and second semester of plebe year was was pretty rough. And, and like you said, after I kind of got my feet under me, um, we started as a, as a class, I felt like we started kind of having that conversation of like, okay, let's like, let's be great. Like, let's not just be great on the field or great on the court. Like, let's, let's be great in the hall. You know, let's be great in our military on the military aptitude side, let's be great in the classroom. And and you talked about going to Wharton, like that is that is the the epiphany, uh, the the uh, epiphany of of greatness. You know what I'm saying? Like that is the top financial finance graduate school in America. And so here you are, from where you started. Now you're in in Wharton. Did you feel like once you got there that did you feel like there was some sort of like, uh, did you feel like it was, they were looking at you funny because of, cause you were, you know, a, brown, a black man, like and you come from the academy and you're, you're and maybe your classmates didn't notice, but your, your grades may not have been the same as some of your peers that have come into the same institution? Um, not really. And I, I think the only, only reason for that one, like the veteran network is pretty strong, right? So you have just like a natural group of, of colleagues, um, through the veterans network, you came early and also the black network too. So I think you kind of just coming in, they're very good about, I think a lot of grad programs are um, putting you with people, you know, who have similar backgrounds and otherwise and kind of support each other, right? So between those two, we all really came in ready to grind and whatever. And also I think at that, that stage, my confidence level was just a little different. I had done, you know, great things in the Navy um, and I kind of understood the game at that point, right? I knew what I was, where I was trying to get to. I was trying to, you know, go to a, a top investment bank, um, which I ended up doing. And I knew, like, I just had to do what I had to do to get there, right? So, like, right. the, you know, I wasn't really, 
I, I think a lot of black people do struggle, right? Um, and that, that's been a common theme, especially at the top programs. Um, but it's just a matter of your mindset for a lot of it. You just have to come in willing to do what it takes and, you know, try not to make any excuses whether or not the world is fair or geared against you or not. You just got to go and grind and, you know, ask for help when you need it and so forth. Reflecting on what one of the things you said, um, George, when you initially started talking to Keenan about, you know, um, being um, at Navy freshman year and, and the amount of um, people that were recruited just for the basketball team, um, 10 freshmen started, three finished as seniors graduating. Um, and and Keenan reflecting on how difficult it was for him, you know, to make that transition. Is, is that, I mean, is that, that, that seems just to an outsider hearing that, like, you know, I mean, that's 30%, that's a lot of attrition quickly. Um, let me, help me understand, you know, why that is. Is it just the rigors of not only the requirements of D1 sports, but also compounding that with the requirements of Navy and, and boot camp? And also, second question is because of that sort of, you know, rigorous, intense uh, requirement of balancing your commitment and sports, did you feel like that, you know, played into being able to then make the adjustments? like seeming like years two through four, like, oh, this is nothing. And then like you said, going to Wharton, you were ready. You're like, at this point, I know I, I got it. Like answer both of those for me, if you don't mind. Yeah, for sure. On the attrition side, what happens there is um, one, they over recruit because they know there's going to be attrition, but they know there's going to be attrition because the academic standards are harder. You have this military portion, which none of us, most of us did not do our JR or TC or didn't know anything about. So you're learning that. Um, and then, you know, basketball is that much harder, right? So the time, your days are just from, you know, zero, 500 until, you know, midnight or whatever every day. Mm -hmm. um, and with that said, it's also one of the few, if not, you know, one of the handful of schools where you get a scholarship, but if you quit the team, you keep your scholarship, <laughs> right? So, you know, everybody goes to the academy for free, right? So you could just, like that, what would happen? Guys would be playing, they'd be like, I'm miserable. They're like, well, if I just quit the team, now I have this four hour block every single day and mm -hmm. this six hour block every single weekend. And wow. I can just hoop intramurals yeah. and have fun. Why do I need to commit to this? And by the way, I quit the team and I still get to stay in school. And that doesn't happen at other schools, right? You quit, your scholarship goes, now you got to pay money. Right. Um, so that that's the one. And yeah, and as far as like the preparation for business school, you know, it, you, you get there and the experience between the academy and your time in the Navy, just being on deployments and you just take on a significant amount of responsibility at a young age. So I'm showing up at 27, which is the average age going to business school. But I know that I've done 1000 X the amount of like leadership experience and, you know, I've had to overcome a lot of things, not even from like just general life, but to your point from the academy and the Navy. So showing up there, I'm like, you're talking all I literally have to do is go to school like I just gotta study that's it <laughs> I just gotta go to class or not and then like get a grade for like, okay I got this we're good yeah. like I'm not worried about that no doubt and so you, you touched on your naval experience so talk to us about um what did you service select um and you said that you know you you had a good career so like what made your career great or good yes I was a uh, surface warfare officer so meaning you know I drove ships right so um and I, the reason why I think it was good, you know, I did three deployments in five years, uh, two deployments on my first ship, the first deployment for Iraq, Afghanistan. So dropping Marines off in the theater and doing some support there. Um, you know, we evacuated American citizens out of Beirut when Israel was bombing them back in 2006, did a anti-piracy Somali deployment, like the movie Captain Phillips, mm -hmm. uh, did a South America counter narcotic drug smuggling, you know, off the coast of Colombia and Central America. So it was just a, a phenomenal experiences that I had, right? Mm -hmm. um, learned a lot about myself, matured a lot, had terrible leadership my first go round, my second go round was really good. And so it was like, yeah, I was like, you know, I enjoyed this. I, I had a great experience. I was young, I was single, I didn't have anything going on anyway. <clears throat> um, but then thinking long-term career-wise, what I want to do, I knew ultimately I didn't want to spend, you know, my time being the seal of the ship or anything like that. And it was time to, time to get out. Gotcha. Um, so when you were when you're getting out and you're going to business school, like what drove you? Was it was it the, the veteran network that you talked about um, that kind of drove you to say, hey, I want to go to war a place like Warden um, to get an education and work in the, in the fine and work on Wall Street, work work in the finance industry, 
and you know or was it like I have family you know distant cousin mother brother whatever that worked yeah, on Wall Street yeah, like yeah. what pushed you to say yeah Wall Street's where I want to go after I'm finished yeah no, I mean I've had this conversation often and I think I got lucky in that I love what I do um, but honestly I grew up poor right I mean and not exaggerating that you know welfare poor like no lights poor um, and you know, all you know about when you don't have a professional family is the way people make money is doctors, lawyers, or Wall Street, right? At that, mm -hmm. that age, you had heard of these things. Mm -hmm. um, so I was like, all I knew was I didn't want to be broke <laughs> and mm -hmm. I wanted to make a lot of money in Wall I You hear of stories or that people make money and what they do and how they do it, I had no idea. Um, so literally, when I was decided I was getting out, I just started cold calling Academy alums. There was this thing, I savor, which is like a pre-LinkedIn service academy directory and it had names of like alums and where they worked so I just started cold calling alums that were at banks and just been like hey I want to work on Wall Street what how do I get there and the, the common theme was you need to go to business school um, and that's that's literally how I ended up doing it and I and I still didn't almost end up at a bank right I uh, actually a, a 2001 or 2000 grad that I knew had me intern at his firm, um, which is an investment management firm. I did that my first summer. And then I kind of just, someone like mentioned, um, you know, the the private wealth world and banking to me. And I was like, oh, that sounds interesting. And I just followed it and, and again, kind of got lucky. Um, but you know, it's a common theme, right? You only, you, don't, you only know what you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and you don't know what you don't know. And if you don't have, to your point, the family or a mentor, somebody that guides you, and I see it all the time at reunions or other things. People are like, how did you even end up there? Because you just don't know, right? And I just, um, you know, had the wherewithal to ask for help, right? Mm -hmm. in, in addition to finding the right path. No doubt. And, and you know, you, you said some things that kind of is, we, we talked about pre-podcast, like kind of where I wanted to go with the conversation. And one thing you just said, you know, you see you grew up poor and all you really knew was doctor, lawyer, Wall Street to make money. And I think that's interesting because I think for me, what I didn't even really know anything about Wall Street until, I don't know, maybe a year or two ago. Um, maybe while I was in high school. Like, I didn't really know until really the, the financial crisis, um, like what all Wall Street was, right? So, you know, I think it's interesting how many, I, I ask myself often, and this is kind of why I wanted to take the conversation how many young black kids that are in similar positions as to how you came up that don't know like about Wall Street, that think that, okay, I could be a doctor or a lawyer, I got to be an entertainer or an athlete to make money. Rapper hoop that's on the way out the hood. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Like, and then I think that's like a, per, a very pervasive idea um, that people think about. Cause, and, I, and I honestly believe the reason why that is the case is because when you become a successful athlete, when you become a successful entertainer, it's almost expected of you to go back and go back to the hood or to where you come from, you know, do the kids camps. Are you are you spending time in the community? Are you giving out, you know, turkeys and Thanksgiving? Are you doing toy drives for the kids? Are you doing back to school drives for the kids? Like you always see rappers and athletes doing that. But and I, I don't want to generalize, but I don't really see a lot of black wall streeters back in the community now again i'm just speaking from my vantage point and i'm sure i know that you have uh that you that you give back you're a prime reason why i'm where i'm at on wall street right now but um you know i think one could probably paint a, a, a rather general picture to say that that kind of thing doesn't happen like you go to wall street you become really successful and it's like all right i'll just live my life like it's not expected of you as a big time Wall Street CEO or a, a big time doctor or maybe even a big time lawyer to go back and say, all right, I'm going to go help this. I'm going to go back to my community and tell them, like, this is another way you can make it. Like, you don't have to just be a D1 prospect. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. No, I mean, that's a conversation I, I have often, um, you know, with kids in, in that regard, because a lot of it, like, one, to your point of the expectation, is like you're not famous, right? So you just show back up and nobody knows who you are. You're like, right. hey, kids, let me talk to you, right? Right. Um, you know, a, a 
quick way to get, you know, chased up out of your neighborhood. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think, you know, the, the other side and the conversations I have, which is they don't know the that they, one, are capable of it, right? They think that it's, it's some, if they know about it at all, it's some abstract thing that's not available to them that it's just they can't get access to, which is one um, you know, misnomer, I'll try to point out like, yes, you can, it's, it's not as hard as you're making it out to be. And, and two, I think that it all in honesty don't realize, you know, the money potential that's involved, right? You know, when, when I can go back and be like, you know, my quote unquote contract is, you know, more than the average salary of the NBA, right? <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. It's like, you know, the, those types of things um, are not known, right? So it, it's, it's just, again, that what you know and what you don't know and then saying like, listen, there, you, there is a path for you to get here. It's actually a much easier path than sports or rapping or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, the money is as good, if not better, in some circumstances. And I think, I think that to compound that, you know, as a lawyer, someone who's um, been able to, you know, reach successes outside of the traditional path, or I should, that, that, that sounds naive to say traditional path is to go through sports, but someone who's been able to. Um, you know, reach successes in outside of what people perceive to be, you know, the way out of the, the hood per se. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I do find it incredibly um, valuable to the youth to be able to sort of show them how, hey, there's here's another pathway. Here's another, you know, great way to make sure that you're always going to have financial stability. And then I can get them excited, though, when I start talking about, hey, I meshed my passion in sports. You know, like I love sports, but I wasn't necessarily good enough to play professionally or maybe i was but I, my mom just wouldn't let me play football and <laughs> I took the opportunity regardless and uh, you know i took the opportunity regardless and I'm the best of it so you know, i get to around guys like keenan reynolds but i found that resonates and you know what you know what that was crazy like you know there is opportunities you got to go out and like find those things those touch points you know like the cool things and and if you do say it to kids that'll listen and it's crazy like you're right, like going back to the, you know, the place you grew up in and like speaking randomly or going in and trying to talk to people, it's not going to hit home and you can't run a camp, but you can hit up the rec center or you can hit up, you know, whatever, you can hit the school. Yeah. And it definitely helps for sure. Gets kids excited about things other than just the obvious fun stuff. Cause I know all I cared about when I was a kid was sports, even though I was focused on academics. For sure. And, and I'm going to sit up for this. Um, so what they, George said, he said, I go back and I could tell them, Hey, I make, I make what, uh, you know, the average NBA, really more than the average NFL salary. And I'm going to tell y'all, that's no cap. Like, he's not capping. He told me that. He told me, you know, what he makes. And that's what got me in the business that he's in. So I'm going I'm to just put that out there now. Like, I asked him. that I was trying to figure out, like, what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do. You know what I'm saying? And I asked him. He told me. And I said, and literally, literally 12 hours later, I made the phone call to say, all right, this is what I want to do. So um, sure. there is there is good money in it, but I think the thing that people kind of miss, and this goes kind of this like ties perfectly into the next topic that I want to get to, is not necessarily fast money. Like people people kind of get, especially in our community, and I, I mean really any community, but we're just gonna focus on what we know from what where we where we come from. Uh, in in the in our in our demographic, fast money is what you see. Like fast money is sexy. Fast money is everywhere. Like. How can I get rich quick? And I think when it comes to things like being a lawyer, when it comes to things like being a doctor, being on Wall Street, being in tech, a lot of times those things are more of a like a hockey stick curve. You know what I'm saying? Like you start low, you know, and then as you become a master of your craft, you have an exponential increase in your earning capability. And a lot of times, especially in our culture, we're, we're in a microwave culture. People want things now. I don't want, I'm not a patient person. Like, I'm not trying to wait. I don't want to go to two, business school for two years. I don't want to go to law school for three years. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to take the time to be a master and, and come up and be a master entrepreneur um, that comes up with the next tech ba breakthrough that can change the way the world works. You know what I'm saying? Like, that, those things take time. Yeah, you can make a whole lot of money, but I think part of the, the less appealing, pro, the less appealing part of those jobs is you can't, play three years in college and then sign a contract for 30 million. You know what I'm saying? And then you sign your contract and the next day you're a multi-millionaire. Like I'm telling you as somebody that signed a, a, a pretty nice contract, when you get those, those checks, like it looks great. Like you, I want more of it. Like I want the fast money. 
And and so, but I think that 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 mindset kind of plays into the fact that I feel like as a as black people, we are behind the on a large scale. We're behind the eight ball on financial literacy. And I think there there are other things that are at play at that. Um, I could think of you know 400 years worth of, of things to point out as why that's the case. So I guess my whole point of this of where I'm going with it is how can we like make financial literacy like large scale accessible? Like I feel like it's pockets of it. I see it. You know, people on my on my Instagram timeline, Twitter timeline. They, they talk about, you know, assets, they talk about, you know, properties, they talk about the concept of generational wealth. But, you know, as somebody who has been around generational wealth, George, what do you think we have to educate our people on? And what is it going to take for us to start getting more of that in our community? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's another topic that, that comes up a lot, right? And again, the, the first thing I'll say to this to people all the time, I'm like, listen, I know that it's a steps, step process to get ultimately to where I am or to your point, a lawyer, a doctor, whatever else it is. I'm like, the life is super long if you think about it, right? I mean, and it, and it, and it goes fast, but you know, I'm whatever, 37. And, you know, who I was at 25 is like a vastly different person from who I was at 30, right? Mm -hmm. And you almost like reinvent yourself every five or so years. Um, especially if you're growing and you're doing new things. And then like, I'm still quote unquote young, right? Yeah. <laughs> in, in life, you know, I still have 40 more years to go. And what happens is people will want to not take the first step, right? Um, but next thing you know, like two years, you could have just done it, right? You could have mm -hmm. just did the two years at the community college. You could have just done the four years or whatever else it is. And then you'd be there. But now here you are four years later in the exact same place and you've done nothing to get to the goals or to, to make progress or whatever, right? So it's that short sightedness to your point that, you know, microwave culture or whatever. Um, and, and how, you know, how do we solve it or what's the way around it? I think there are a few components to it. One is, you know, the, the culture, right? Um, and we're seeing it already for those who have quote unquote made it, the, the Jay-Z's or, you know, the, the Durant, LeBron, Kobe, those who are saying like, listen, actually, wealth and managing your money and being responsible and not just buying and spending every dollar is actually a good thing generational wealth these conversations as far as like the hip-hop culture is evolving towards that mm -hmm. and the other part is exactly what you know we're talking about before which is those of us myself you che you know once we are more visible and it's i mean i i kind of take that responsibility myself too to educate others and again not try to not be preachy about it but like, listen, here, I just need to expose you to this. Because again, it's so much of it is you just don't know and you think that you it's not for you, you can't make it. Um, in our community, you know, which, I mean, we could talk about school and education system, which is a whole other problem. A lot of the kids in these communities do not like school. So when you're saying, okay, in order to do what you're doing, I need to go to more school. Yeah. Then they're like, nah, like I'm, I'm good. Yeah. But you know, for sports and for others, other things, you don't need it, right? So again, it's in this kind of coaching them through that too. Like, yes, it's school, but it's not like what you're used to growing up and like the school system that you grew up in is actually much better and it's more interesting and so forth. Um, but I think the dialogue just has to be constantly changing and evolving from being buyers of things, right? To owners of things. Um, and, and it's starting a little bit, but I think it's on all of us to continue pushing that dialogue forward. No doubt. And, and I think, you know, as I, as I mentioned, we are, you know, we're 400 years behind. Uh, we, we, we're starting, you know, way behind in the race. And, you know, what I, I like to use Keenan, if I can interject, you know, sure. I think it's hard for like an everyday average listener. I, and we have a, a hopefully a diverse and, you know, a, like a, an audience that's receptive to all, you know, sort of people's mentalities. But what Keenan mentions that like we're 400 years behind, I think people have to understand that you're not saying like, you're not making a reference to something like, oh, we're still, you know, um, in slavery or we're still being oppressed or maybe you are. But either way, what people need to understand is let's take a step further into what that means. And from like a wealth standpoint, you know, I want to give people the analogy. I like to do this a lot. I say, well, listen, imagine when people say that because some people get offended by that and I want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. So imagine I say to you, hey, look, we're going to play Monopoly. 
um, I get to go around the board 400 times. <laughs> um, and you, you have to finish the sorry game. You're playing sorry, by the way. So before you can even step to go on Monopoly, I get to go around 400 times and you got to finish sorry. Or if I say, hey, we're going we're gonna to play Monopoly and we're going to start at go, but every single spot on the game is going to have either hotels or houses already on it. And you got to figure out a way to survive in this game and figure out a way to either take my houses or we got to create more real estate. Um, and that's the kind of crazy thing about why, you know, people don't understand. I mean, and we, this is a whole nother conversation. And by the way, one false step and then you go to jail. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. And, like, and you got to pay money to get out of jail that you don't have. because you, you didn't even make it all the way past the first few, few steps on the board. Mm. Yeah. It's crazy. Right. And like people don't think about it. And then you, oh, you might land on the wrong, you might land on the wrong spot and you get the, that, that sorry card and you got to pay tax and you're like, but I don't have the same school you got. And I don't, I don't have that. I, I, my parents aren't on the board already, you know, taking in income from the hotels. And when we get in trouble, we can sell the hotel and then put four houses back down. Like, it's just people don't understand that. And so when people say, hey, man, no, things have changed. Things have progressed. Yes, things have progressed. Like there is a way onto the Monopoly board. But you're even if you're on the board and you're playing the game, if the game's already been played for like significant amounts of time, you no you're going to be behind. Yeah. So, and you got to, and then we, as those who've made it to the board per se, um, we can't be critical of those who don't understand our plight. Rather, we got to explain to them, this is the, like, this is the plight. Like I didn't, my parents weren't on the board because there was laws that said it can't be on the board. So like, I got to work that much harder just to make sure when I get here, I keep it. So, so and, and Che, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but part of the problem with it is that they will look to you or I or Keenan and say, well, look, they did it, right? So why can't the rest of you do it, right? And, and we'll completely discount the fact that, you know, how, but even like, I mean, we can go on a full black history lesson here, but like redlining and, you know, so you put all these people into a community and then you give them no resources, right? And then, so now you don't have that equity in your home to borrow on it to send your kid to college or pay bills or just live a normal life or whatever else it is, right? But they'll use that bootstrap, like, well, look, George, you came, you were poor and you got good grades and you did blah, blah, blah. So why can't everybody else do that? Which is, you know, it, it's just such a false. So like, I'm like, you shouldn't have to be one of a million, yeah. right? Yeah. Like to to be able to reach the same as everybody else and I, this is i'm not even joking i just had this conversation uh, the other day and i was like you know you shouldn't you should be able to be a mediocre white guy and get the same job without having to be a super excellent black guy right or woman or whatever else it is right and that's where we are you have to be the 0.01 percent yeah, to make it to the same level as a mediocre you know, a majority member. And that and that's the, the real issue. And I and I and I hope that this this dialogue provides some level of sort of thought to those who don't necessarily understand that. Cause it's not like I'm out here angry or upset every day that I'm, you know, able to reach sub level of successes or that I've been able to get to monopoly. But it's also but like my my concept of what it is to play in the game is different because I haven't had the access to maybe say the capital that you've had, not because you deserved it, but maybe because your grandfather fought in the same war next to my grandfather. When my grandfather got back from war, they told him he could not qualify for a mortgage and he was not allowed to build a house in a property that was not within this red zone. He was literally redlined and, and generational wealth is built up through the home. And so when I got to college or my dad got to college and maybe had the same grades as your dad, he couldn't go to his father and say, Hey, can you take out a mortgage to help me go through school? Maybe my dad had to go into more debt than your dad. So then when I got to college, Che, all the way down the grandson line, I couldn't go to my grandfather or my dad. And maybe if I want to start a business, I couldn't go to my granddad and say, Hey, can I borrow a hundred thousand dollars? You know, I mean, it's those little things. Where maybe you couldn't even go to college because you had to work you know, with the family, yeah. right? You needed help to support. They needed the food on the table. And they're like, well, we can't afford for you to leave. You need to be here and work and support. And that's, again, not to cut you off, but it's, it's 100%. all of those compounding things. And then- And I, and I love it, Keenan, I'll let, let it slide back to you. And so I think that also ties in, and and I just want to lastly say that that's, we want people to understand that the, the plight is not necessarily black and white. There are socioeconomic disadvantages, white and black, but the reason 
for just reality that there are sometimes much more as it pertains to minorities is because of the system that was set up that we're still trying to get back from. So that's all. I want people to understand that. 100%, man. And, uh, you know, I, uh, several, a lot of things said, and it's driving me to, and it's really, it's really working out perfectly because, like, the, the back end of this conversation fits perfect um, with with where you guys just took it. And, and there was something I got, I'm looking at my notes now, and, and there was something I, I wrote down to think about, and I was like, do you feel like black people need educations like Wharton, the Naval Academy, top 20 graduate schools to compete in this world? And I, I've really been thinking about that question. It's been on my heart, um, you know, for a little bit because I was like, OK, if, if you're going um, I, and I'm, I'm thinking about uh, the Wells Fargo CEO's comment that he just recently made and then apologized for saying that the reason why they're not hiring a lot of black executives to have a seat at the table is there is a lack of talent, right? So is it is it the kind is the 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 perception that there is a lack of talent because there is a lack of black people at these quote unquote top institutions? You know what I'm saying? Like, is it because yes, they may have had a, a, a great career and they may have graduated from a state school and have all the qualifications and be an excellent leader, but they just but if I stack them up to somebody that say went to Yale or went to Stanford it just doesn't quite compare. And I think I'm going to go with the guy on the left because he's quote unquote more talented, even though he may not be a, the better leader. So, you know, I, I thought about that and I, I'm curious to hear you guys' take on it in light of what you all just said. It's like you, you, you're already starting behind. And then it's like, and if you don't, if you're not the cream of the crop, like you said, George, you, you know, you, you go to the state school, you're already you're behind because of who you are. And then you're behind because your education is perceived to not be up to par even if you are more than qualified for the position that you're going after so it almost makes you feel like it's like it's either top 20 you know top criminal cop type of institution or you know good luck trying to trying to win that seat at the table like it's already uphill battle but if you don't go to a top school now you're trying to run uphill with a 50 pound weight vest on for a little sports analogy yeah i mean i'll, I'll start um for sure I mean, look, I, I can I can take this on a, on a big tangent because, you know, I'm kind of going through this whole thought process and stuff like in this COVID world with my daughters. I have two daughters, seven and nine. Right. Um, so the short answer is historically, that answer is yes. They they are looking in the wrong places they're, or they're looking in only the same places. Right. They're looking, OK, what are the Ivies, whatever. And as we know, the Ivies are one percent black, two, three percent black and brown, whatever, or diversity just generally, right? Mm -hmm. um, and trying to get better. So they've been fishing in the same pool and wonder why they're not catching any different fish, right? Um, now that's starting to change a little bit, especially post George Floyd, um, mm -hmm. in that, you know, there had already been dialogue about like looking more at HBCUs or state schools or trying to find talent, quote unquote, in other places. Um, but I think what, you know, in common sense tells us we all know this, just because you went to school doesn't make you smart, right? Mm. There are plenty of people who don't have the quote unquote schooling or the quote unquote education who crush it, right? And start, I mean, think of several tech companies, right? Um, Bill Gates and Zuckerberg, whatever they leave, they quit college, they build multi-billion dollar businesses. Um, so do you need to be at these institutions to get these jobs, to do the jobs effectively? No, right? And, to, and why I said I can pivot this a little bit is like, so like for my daughters, you know, we were sending them to the, one of the, if not the top tier private school in New York City, right, on the Upper East Side. Um, and you feel like, okay, we need to play this game, right? You get into this school because their network, right, and their classmates are all important people and that school feeds them directly to the Ivies, which feeds them, which feeds them. Um, but this environment, which, you know, Keenan knows, but at the beginning of COVID, we went to Hawaii and I'd been in Hawaii for the last seven months or so working remotely in my daughter's, you know, school remotely. And we were just all so happy because we had the time. School separates families, school ships your kids off, right? And now they're raised by strangers. Um, <clears throat> and institutions, firms are now saying, you know what, even colleges, we don't need you to have the traditional schooling. We realize that people are capable and talented despite or in spite of not going to these institutions. Mm -hmm. So we actually decided we're not sending them back to school, right? Um, we don't, I don't want to pay the hundred, 
thousand dollars a year or whatever else it is to feed them instance because it doesn't produce happiness per se and this is where i think i'm torn on trying to circle back to our community right on the one hand i played the game and it got me to where i am so that i can afford to make these decisions for my family mm -hmm. um on the other hand i'm like well i just want them to be happy so what does that mean right like do, do i think that most of us who went to like a good college and a good grad school and like are working in these technical jobs are happy most are not right and i think there's plenty of data in that goes like more money doesn't make you happier per se so i think for our community i feel like instead of us chasing the ivies and you know bringing us up to them we need to level set for everybody and everybody benefits from that not just black people right if you just stop making it seem like an ivy league is the path or like that is the filter to be great at something and say like no actually there are a lot of people who are great who don't go to ivies who don't go to college just like scrap that if you were interested in it like i think i think i told you this came and if i had showed up at 35 years old to my job that i'm doing today right i could still do it phenomenally mm -hmm. if i went to no school right because like mm -hmm. you learn on the job and the navy teaches you that i showed up i had political science background i was an engineer on the ship right guess right. what I learned it <laughs> and mm -hmm. I did really well at it, you know? So anyway, I know it's, it's kind of rambling, it's bringing a lot of things, but I think my point is the game is still developed that way to say you need to go to these top tier institutions. But I think that the, the pressure needs to be on corporations to say, you know what, we're no longer going to search for our talent at these typical pools. We're gonna find them wherever they are. And I think that will ultimately help them find better talent and help the general population of people end up in paths that maybe if in the beginning you stumbled and you couldn't get to the Ivy, you could still end up on Wall Street or as a lawyer or whatever else. Man, that's, man, what an answer. That, that's, that was great, man. Um, and, you know, all great views, things to think about, things that I, we always, me and Che always encourage our listeners to do your own research, have your own opinion. Um, and some of the things that we, we've touched on in this podcast, we talked about seat at the table. We've talked about, you know, generational wealth. Um, and I kind of want to highlight somebody who I feel like really did it, um, really achieved the generational wealth, uh, really came up, played the game, um, but it has been in the news for rather unsavory reasons. So for our listeners, I'll give a complete background. Um, I'm referring to Robert Smith. Um, Robert Smith is the richest, wealthiest black man in America. He is not an entertainer. He is not a rapper. Fun fact about the the, the black billionaires in America, if I'm not mistaken, you guys can fact check me on this, he is the only person that is not involved in sports or entertainment in some shape, form, or fashion, which I find very interesting. Of all the things that people get rich and get on the Forbes list for, black people except for Robert Smith in America, or you got Diddy, Oprah, Jay-Z, Kanye, Robert Johnson, all entertainment moguls. All Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan, athlete. So it's like that's where we were kind of cornered, as we were, we've talked about earlier, and they, they made it to the pinnacle. They are the point zero 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 one percent right? So now you got this guy, Robert Smith. He's a Cornell grad, goes to Columbia, gets his MBA. Um, is an investment banker at Goldman Sachs in the late 90s, became the co-head of Enterprise Systems and Storage, um, did several deals, high-profile deals, Yahoo, etc. cetera, um, leaves in 2000, goes in funds, and starts his own uh, private equity company. Um, very unprecedented. And to our listeners that are unaware of what a private equity company is, I looked at the definition from Investopedia to give you a very textbook answer. And again, got two very knowledgeable gentlemen that can that can add on as they like. But basically, a private equity company is composed of funds and investors that directly invest in private companies or then engage in buyouts of public companies, resulting in the delist delisting of the public equity. So, for example, a public company would be like an Apple or a Tesla, um, and this never happened. But a, a private equity company could seemingly buy them out and take them off of the. They would no longer be listed on a, as a public equity. Um, Institutional and retail investors pro, investors provide the capital for private equity, and the capital can be utilized to fund new technology, make acquisitions, expand working capital, and to bolster and solidify balance sheets. So the company invests in a company, they 
fire people, they change the business model, make things uh, less expensive, raise the margins, et cetera, et cetera. Boom. And then after usually five to seven years, they get out um, and that's where they make their profit. People that are, you know, the the partner level of a private equity company, the, the fee model is structured as they, they take 2% haircut off of the funds that they manage, that they raise, and then 20% of the profits. So um, when they get out of their companies after that five to seven year holding period, 20% of whatever the profit of that sale is goes right into the their pockets. The rest goes to their limited partners um, that are the investors. Um, so that is the uh, private equity one-on-one. How did I do, first of all? Make sure I... That was pretty good. That's pretty good. <laughs> Solid. Solid. <laughs> so, a lot there. <laughs> so anyway, uh, not to get too far off track, Robert Smith made a fortune. He's worth five, over $5 billion. And recently, he's in the news for tax fraud. And um, another uh, thing that he's well known for is he was the commencement speaker in Morehouse in 2019, and he paid off all student debt of graduating uh, seniors at Morehouse College. So very philanthropic guy, um, cares about giving back, advancing black people, doing the things that we're talking about. And now he's in the news for tax fraud. And apparently has been cheating on his taxes the last 15 years. And I, I don't, I'm not sure how to like really think about it because this is not an uncommon thing amongst very wealthy individuals. But I feel like because he is a black man, because he came up in a, a non-typical way of a black man, um, it's it's even got a brighter spotlight on it. Um, and and it's and 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 I don't think this, but I think some people could say, would would try to invalidate his efforts, some of the things that he's done to advance his people or to just advance people in general, um, because of this very glaring um, flaw that he is come out to admit so I, i'm not sure how i think about this um i kind of you know raised an eyebrow when it popped up on my as a, as a wall street journal alert on my phone so really interested to hear what, what you two guys feel about um this development and, and and how this whole thing played out i went first last time che all yours <laughs> yeah i mean happy to speak on it you know i think um it's a, it's a difficult um, question to answer without, um, you know, drawing a uh, immense level of respect to what he did um, with respect to those Morehouse students. That that that, that made change the lives of many young um, men, and I uh, give immense kudos to that. Um, if the philanthropic efforts were um, solely based on um, a desire to enable and empower young black men, then I think there would be no question that what he did was amazing. Um, and I'm not disputing whether or not that is the case. I don't know. Um, if it was to sort of appease um, public, the, the public perception of someone who knew that they were under four years of tax scrutiny by the IRS, and then maybe to allow him to have um, an ability to say, well, I did this versus that. Um, I think that it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a questionable act. And I think that, um, you know, it should be frowned upon, um, but we will never know. And I don't want to draw or cast aspersions one way or the other. Um, I think that once everyone, I think everyone should be, should, should be careful. And I think that um, we shouldn't be quick to, too, too quick to draw um, assumptions as to what his intentions were. But I hope that um, in order for him to show that there was not something that he just did one off to sort of get out of the eye of the government, I hope that he continues to do it. I hope that he develops scholarships. I hope he goes back to the community. I hope he develops um, foundational sort of wealth for people to try to build from. I hope he does an endowment to the school and to every HBCU in the country. Um, when you have a billion dollars, you can do whatever the heck you want. So I think that would prove that it was a real and genuine um, contribution. Um, you know, some of the other things tied to the contribution, like the people he became friends with, acquaintances that he built, et cetera, some of the buddy-buddy stuff looked like it was maybe to protect um, the yeah. investigation. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. Again, I'm not one to, to draw an opinion one way or the other. 
Um, I'm just going to point out facts. But I think factually, if he does those things that show a consistent framework and mentality and mold of wanting to not just be a guest speaker at a commencement who happened to be very successful, who happened to do a very great gesture, because keep in mind, that was at a commencement. He was invited there. He didn't do it arbitrarily without an invitation. So his intentions may have been, wait, this is a great opportunity for me to do something great for a lot of great young men. Mm -hmm. That very well could have been the case. And if that was, kudos to him. I hope he keeps doing it. If it wasn't, then that's another story. So my opinion. On yeah, it. I'm torn on it. Um, and I guess for, for, I think I'm trying to think of how to explain. On, on the one hand, like, you know, obviously he shouldn't have evaded the taxes and should have, have if he did, you know, what he did, um, gone about it in, in a different way, right? Or just paid the tax, he still would have had billions seemingly. I think he paid a two, roughly $200 million fine, right? So for yeah. him, that, you know, it's not a ton of money, right? Um, I think it's a slippery slope being in the business of helping people figure out ways to pay less tax. Um, <laughs> there are, <laughs> you know, there are legal ways to do it, obviously. And, you know, you play the game as, as the system allows you to play it. Mm -hmm. um, but then, then there are ways, you know, ultimately he, the reason why he got off lightly is because he ended up turning into even bigger billionaire tax fraud, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, so slippery slope, right? You're in these circles now and everybody's talking about ideas and maybe you just get close to somebody who is a little bit more nefarious and next thing you know, it, it goes down a path. Anyway, the reason why I'm torn is, is kind of, you know, to piggyback on what Che is saying, he's done a lot of phenomenal things for our community. Um, he has been you know, that one that you can point to to say, like, look, he is the wealthiest billionaire of the black billionaires. And the also coincidentally shows not, you know, um, sports and entertainment. Right. So he that again, to your point, he went the school Wall Street, you know, and made the most billions out of Michael Jordan, the arguably the most famous athlete of all time, mm -hmm. Oprah, et cetera. Right. Um, so to have him as that pillar and, and what makes me what's why I'm torn about it is is you know, a lot of discussions, especially in this past year or two, where our greats <laughs> keep on getting knocked down, yeah. right? Uh, you're not allowed to be flawed as, as a black great, right? If, if you are done phenomenal things and then you made a mistake or you did something you weren't supposed to do, apparently it invalidates everything that you've done prior to that, mm -hmm. right? And I don't think that we in this country have done a good job of allowing our black people to or our black greats to recover from their mistakes right um and i'll even say i mean honestly it's a lot of times it's black people who are more guilty of it than the general population but the media will start it yeah um you know so so i, I think that's where i'm like you know what should he have paid his taxes sure right um does it invalidate everything he did even with even if it was with malintent and that'd be unfortunate but it, there's still these people whose lives are forever changed, right? And will probably go on to do great things regardless of if he was doing to cover up for himself or not. So that's where I'm like, you know, that that midshipman honor, integrity, loyalty inside of me, right? On the one hand, mm -hmm. it's like, uh, you know, you shouldn't have done these things, of course. On the other side, I'm like, well, you know, he's with all that he's done, he's still changed a lot of lives. And I mean, and this Morehouse is the, is the only thing that really got publicity. I mean, he's put, he's done a ton. I've seen him on the street for, you know, in my my decade on the street he's the name right who does every a lot of things for the community um so it's not a new thing either uh so you know that that i don't know that that's that's kind of where i am right i mean ultimately shouldn't have done it but have done yeah. great things and will probably continue to do great things more for it no doubt uh and you know i kind of you, you made some, some really great points about not being able to be a, a black titan and be flawed i mean still human like and as I mentioned, I mean, there have been numerous cases of people doing the same thing, um, even at the the highest level. But uh, we're not gonna go there. Uh, but yeah. nonetheless, uh, I, I was just kind of curious. I thought it was pretty interesting information. I felt like maybe that like most people didn't even know who he was or what he did or how he got to where he was. So um, I just felt like we needed to touch on it based on the conversation that we were having. But I mean, we're we're up against our time and. Uh, you know, we, we like, like I always say, um, especially when we have guests, I know that you got you got a lot of things you're doing, and we really appreciate you taking some time out to, to join us and give us your opinion and really reflect on your background. Um, 
and you know help educate our listeners. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for having me and Shay as well. Good seeing you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us. Yep. No problem. Uh, Appreciate you again, man. And uh, I'll definitely be in touch. Yes, sir. All right. See you. Take care, George. Yep. Bye. Man, what an excellent, excellent speaker, um, or I'm sorry, interviewer, uh, or interviewee to to have on the show. And, and so, Keenan, great, great job. I think people, for the most part, will get to understand and, and see exactly what it takes to become um, successful outside of the normal um, perceived way to to you know to, to remove themselves from um, troublesome or difficult circumstances. George is just an excellent guy. So. I know we're we're pressed for time, Keenan. I got to ask you a question since it's the week that it's going along with the week that we're going to be on. Um, speaking of generational black wealth, um, since we talked on topics, not yet a billionaire, but someone of significant wealth is actually playing in the World Series this week, and I know he's a friend of yours. Um, Nashville Zone, uh, Mookie Betts, uh, okay. played for the Dodgers this week in the World Series. In fact, I think they're playing now. And Tina, we're going to have to move into a conversation next week. I think it's going to be more sports oriented because we. We have touched on these points. We have brought it to the attention of a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Um, Just things that we think are important. We want people to grow. We want people to keep their lives in a way that's going to help them grow and become more fruitful and fulfilled. But Mookie this year became one of those people. He did it through sports. He did it through Mm -hmm. a medium that we said that Mm -hmm. is, you know, what people perceive, but different medium in the sense of baseball, which, you know, 20, 30 years ago, a lot of people perceived baseball as an opportunity just as maybe um, they would or football or basketball. But now, from at least the minority community, uh, as it pertains to young black men, it's less and less these days. But Mookie's an exception to that rule. One of the highest, if not the highest paid baseball player. Yeah. So, um, disregarding friendship, if that's possible, who you got in the World Series? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not even gonna lie to you, man. I don't even watch a little baseball. Like, <laughs> I don't watch no baseball. But I'm going for my dog. Uh, definitely got a root for Mookie. Um, Nashville's own anybody from the field getting my support. Uh, shout out to the boys running LA, Mookie, Taylor. Um, hopefully, you're gonna have both of them on uh, in the near future. Uh, you know, growing up, me and Mookie, we actually played against each other in football and basketball. Um, and you know, he was a good friend coming up. And then obviously, you know, as you get older, you kind of go your separate ways to do your thing. But I know his his dad and my dad are friends, and you know, definitely have. Uh, his his parents used to bowl with my parents, um, so you know, and he we used to I used to always see him at the bowling alley and whatnot. So I'm really rooting for him, man. He's he's doing some great things. He definitely he made some really good. I saw him make some good plays. I don't watch baseball, but I did see him make some great plays uh, the other day against the Braves. A um, couple uh, huge defensive stops, um, and then you know helping them you know battle back from a three one deficit. I tell you what, Atlanta, the city of Atlanta is just really becoming known for just blowing large leads like that is like the, the legacy of atlanta sports and i don't know how i feel about that because i'm actually about to move to atlanta so you know I, I would like to actually enjoy like a championship parade in the near future but the way it's looking with atlanta sports over the past few years i don't know if it's gonna happen man but uh well we got we got esq client marlon davidson down there yeah, so. shout out marlon man yeah, yeah we, shout out to marlon he's doing his thing um well I, I can't say I blame you for uh, giving a shout out and love to Nashville. I, I'm rooting for the uh, Dodgers as well. I'm not a big baseball guy either, but we have um, the Dodgers, I think, visiting for the third time in four years to the World Series, and I don't think they've won in over 30 years. So um, maybe Mookie can be that 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 difference maker and, and see if they can bring on the championship. But um, I just had to ask before we get out. So I know we're pressed for time, so I'm going to let you – you finish this off, man. But great show, great, great guest, Keenan. Thanks so much for for making that a part of uh, the listening audiences today. So yeah, man. Uh, to our listeners, man, we appreciate you sticking it, sticking in there for the whole the whole hour. And uh, you know, we're gonna continue to keep coming at you with great inter- uh, interviewees, great content, things to make you think, do research. Uh, we've been hitting it heavy, like I said, for the past few weeks. Um, but I think you know, coming up, we're gonna. Have a, there's a lot of things to be talked about in the sports world that we're going to touch on in the, in the near future. So appreciate you again. And signing off from the Quarterback in Your Life podcast.